Good afternoon. On behalf of the California Chapter 4 American Academy of Pediatrics, I would like to welcome you to our webinar, Moving Teens Safely, Incorporating Teen Safe Driving Education into the Pediatric Office Visit. My name is Jamie McDonald, and I will be your moderator today. This webinar is being presented to you today through a generous grant from a partnership of the Allstate Foundation and the American Academy of Pediatrics. We have three distinguished speakers today, but before I introduce our first presenter, I want to give you a few housekeeping instructions. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. You may type a question in the space provided on your control panel and submit it at any time during the webinar. Questions will be collected and asked at the end of the presentation. Please indicate which speaker you would like to address the question. Following the webinar, you will receive a brief online evaluation, and we ask that every attendee please complete this as it helps us to improve our educational programming. For those of you earning CME, there will be one hour provided, and we will send a PDF certificate via email to you following receipt of your evaluation. Um, we are also recording this webinar, and we'll provide it on our website at www aapca4.org for later viewing. Please feel free to provide any additional feedback to us regarding this webinar. Your input is very important to us. And please vi visit our website um, for future educational events. Thank you. Our first presenter is Dr. Phyllis Agrin. Dr. Agrin, board certified in general pediatrics and pediatric gastroenterology, is Professor Emeritus, UCI School of Medicine. Her research area is Injury Epidemiology and Prevention. She served on the National AAP Committee on Injury, Violence, and Poison Prevention, chaired the section, and now serves on the Violence Prevention Subcommittee, Committee on Foreign Management, as well as the California Department of Public Health Injury Prevention Advisory Committee. She is immediate past president of California Chapter 4 AAP. Her newest project, Clinic in the Park, Promoting Health and Wellness, has been awarded a catch grant. She has been an advocate for public health policies aimed at reducing trauma and injury to children. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for that excellent introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk to you about moving kids safely, the teen driving, the pediatricians, and the parents. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose, and I do not intend to discuss an unapproved investigative use of a commercial product or device in the presentation. First, I'd like to show you local Orange County data on motor vehicle occupant injuries by age. As you can see, these data demonstrate the magnitude of adolescent death and injury from motor vehicle crashes compared to all other age groups. Death, injury, and hospitalization, and the emergency department data is in the right lower area of the slide, markedly increase beginning at age 15 when these adolescents are likely to be passengers with other teens, some of them are driving, and the incidence of death, injury, and emergency department visits peak at about 18 years of age. The American Academy of Pediatrics recently created a matrix, Improving Children's Health Through Transportation Initiative. This is an excellent resource. The website is listed above, and all the information is available in one place. It's user-friendly, and it's a comprehensive document that contains all our AAP policy statements, our tools, our messages, and resources. So you can click on any area that you would like, for example, under injury prevention, and we want to talk about educating colleagues. It will provide you with the policy statements and all the information you need and eventually take you down what we're talking about today is teen drivers. Okay. Okay, why are we talking about this today? Because motor vehicles are the leading cause of death and acquired disability among our teens, 
and Bright Futures and American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines state that we should include teen driving safety at all the well child visits beginning when the, child, uh, the patient is likely to be even a passenger in a vehicle. The AAP policy statement, the teen driver is excellent. And then Bright Futures has visit by visit anticipatory guidance uh, recommendations for the teen driver. Now we're going to stop for a quiz. Here's a number of neuroscientists that you may be familiar with, Alzheimer, Fraud, Broca, and then the rental car agencies. Who's the best neuroscientist on teen driving? You might want to jot it down. And the answer is the rental car agencies. And the reason is they don't rent until you're 25 years of age because they well understand the risks of the teen driving and the crash risks. As pediatricians, we need to again know and reinforce to our families that it's the leading cause of injury death, especially uh, if you look at our Orange County data, six teens are injured every day in the county. This is a um, picture of a crash that occurred in Anaheim where a 16-year-old driver essentially killed her best friend as a result of being in a car crash. No child should have to live with the aftermath of this, and it is preventable. When we look at drivers in motor vehicle accidents, what's their role in terms of preventing crashes, what's the role as a pedestrian or preventing pedestrian casualties and bicycle-related risks? We have to look at who the driver is, and in this case we're talking about the teen driver. Does the driver always wear a seat belt? We know from data that teens may not. What kind of car is the uh, driver using. Does the driver know how to drive the car? Is it an appropriate vehicle for the driver? Or does the driver not know how to manipulate the car? What's the driver doing that puts him or her at risk to himself or others? This is texting, being on the cell phone, uh, drinking, uh, not only alcohol but non-alcoholic beverages. And who else is in the car that could possibly distract or otherwise impair the ability of the driver. Here's a case study of Devon Drives. Devon's 16 years old. She just got her driver's license. She was given a large SUV for her birthday because she's responsible, she's a good student, and she has many friends. She's very social. She's involved in many school and community activities. However, she's upset that the graduated driver licensing law does not allow her to drive her friends, and her parents basically agree because they're tired of hauling her and her friends around. So think about what the issues are, and we're going to go through and discuss them in a minute. I put this in because I think it's important for us to understand what do teens think and what do their parents think. The teen says, wow, I got my license to freedom. I don't wake up in the morning and decide that today I'm going to speed or text message while driving. It's an unplanned event when they do it. Yes, I make mistakes, I get sloppy, but I'm a pretty good driver. However, sometimes I find myself in a situation where I have to text while driving or my friends are pushing me to drive faster. You know, my executive function is not yet completely developed. From the parent's perspective, driving is often regarded as a rite of passage. I know he will drive carefully. He won't drink and drive, use his cell phone, or text message. He will always use his seatbelt. Parents tend to underestimate teens' behaviors, and the parent, hopefully after we uh, get involved in some anticipatory guidance, will come to the conclusion, I guess I had better set some limits. Let's look at myths versus fact. Responsible teen. My teen is responsible and would not drive dangerously, so he is not at risk. The fact. All teens are at higher risk because they lack driving experience and judge, 
judgment that only come with time and driving. So back to Devin, she's responsible and she's a good student, but she doesn't have the experience. The experienced driver, the myth is my team had plenty of practice driving during driver education and the 50 hours required by the California graduated driver licensing law. The fact, driver education and practice driving are only the beginning of learning to drive. Becoming a safe driver, just like any other skill, takes time, practice, and experience. The myth. It would be safer if my team had a friend in the car in case something happens. The fact, crash risks are nearly double with one passenger and even increase more with each additional passenger. Even responsible friends, even good kids, can be distracting to the driver. We've had a number of crashes in the county um, where kids have distracted the teen driving driver and a crash has resulted. We need to protect against this. Let's talk about the vehicles. Devon was given an SUV. Does she know how to drive an SUV? Did she practice driving an SUV? Is it easy to manage? Your teen has the greatest chance of a crash of anyone in the family, so your teen has to drive the safest vehicle available. When we were just getting our driver's license, I think traditionally our parents gave us an old car, thinking that if something happened, it wouldn't be such a casualty. But those cars, and today's older cars, don't have the safety devices, such as the vehicle stability system, um, that newer cars have. So the recommendation is have your teens drive a mid to full size vehicle with a small engine and airbags. And the data shows you should not let your teen get their own vehicle until they gain a lot more unsupervised driving experience. Car ownership is another issue. The myth, by having a car, my teen will learn to take responsibility. The fact, no. Teens with their own vehicles are at greater risk because they tend to drive more and have fewer restrictions placed on them. And there's several articles in pediatrics that document this. Now, why are adolescents at high risk for injury? It relates to their development. The teen at adolescence is a time of major change. They're developing new skills, new models, peer influences are tremendous. They're developing autonomy and preparing for adulthood. Toss in driving in the car. They need a new skill set. They have new responsibilities. They have new power, new autonomy, and new opportunities to do things and go places they couldn't before. For parents, there's less schlepping. They can, kids can take themselves. They can run errands. They can help with family transportation. But a big fact here is that they don't have executive function until well into their tw um, 20s. And it seems to me you need executive function to drive. Here's a cartoon that was in the LA Times. I don't know what happened, officer. I was just texting my friend about how totally unfair the new teen driver rules are, and the tree jumped out in front of me. But let's look at the bright side. There's less drinking and driving among the teens. They're younger and they have faster reaction times. They have few comorbid conditions that might imp uh, impede or make the outcome from a car crash more difficult. And they're teachable. And that's what we have to do as pediatricians, and that's what we have to encourage our parents to do. So in terms of parenting, we know it's not easy. Parents want their children to avoid risk behaviors, but driving confers a benefit to the family. So our challenge is to ensure that the skills are acquired along with safety measures and limits. So how do we do that? Um, Joe O'Neill, our next speaker, is going to get uh, have more of a discussion on this, but it basically boils down to rules, mentoring, monitoring, and the graduated driver licensing laws which we must enforce and endorse. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Agrin. Um, our next presenter is 
Lieutenant Mike Hallinan of the Irvine Police Department. Mike holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Sociology and a Master of Science, Science in Administration of Justice and Security. He is a graduate of the California Post's Sherman Block Leadership Institute, the LAPD West Point Leadership Program, and the International Association of Chiefs of Police Law Enforcement Business Fellowship. Lieutenant Hallinan currently works in the Office of Professional Standards. He has prior police experience with the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department and the Los Angeles Police Department. His past assignments include SWAT, Detectives, Narcotics, Meth Lab Task Force, FTO, DUI Enforcement, Patrol Operations, Office of the Chief of Police, and the Manager of the Traffic Bureau. Thank you. Let me unmute you, Mike. There you go. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much for the introduction, Ben, and I hope you could hear me okay. So the, the Graduated Driver's License Program, uh, it, it first came about uh, by the DMV in 2006 after uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles looked at all the crash data, and they realized that there was an alarming increase in juvenile-related uh, injury traffic collisions where there were significant injuries and uh, so and specifically they narrowed it down by hour and they realized that especially at night between like 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. there was a dramatic increase uh, in these injury traffic collisions caused by new drivers basically between the ages of 16 and 18 years old. So uh, they enacted this California law, which was the Graduated Driver's License Program, and it basically uh, required that uh, there was new stringent rules in place for the new driver. And the first one being that uh, a new driver, when you become 15 and a half years old, you're eligible for a permit. You're, you're able to go to the, uh, the DMV, take the test, and get a permit, which allows you to drive with your parents. Now, in the old days, all you had to do was drive with another person that was 21 years or older in the car, and uh, you were allowed to drive with them during this permit phase. Uh, now, when you obtain, with a graduated driver's license uh, program, uh, the new driver, and that's somebody who's between the ages of uh, uh, 15 and a half and 17 and a half, uh, they, get a, they must obtain a provisional permit from the, the Department of Motor Vehicles, and they have to complete 50 hours of supervised driving with their, uh, with their either parent or guardian. And then 10 of these hours has to be performed at night during the hours of darkness. So it gives them uh, not only the exposure to the road, but the, it's different at night. The, the roadways are different, and you know, with all the, the different types of lighting, whether it's poor lighting or freeway or uh, what have you. And then uh, the parent or guardian is responsible for certifying in writing that these number of hours uh, are uh, completed by the, the juvenile. And then uh, after that, once they, become, they, they have their 16th birthday and they've, they've done these 50 hours of driving and they've obtained their permit, uh, they're allowed to, they, they basically have a, a graduated driver's license. And uh, there is restrictions placed on them. So uh, the restrictions are, are pretty simple, that they can't carry passengers in the car uh, unless they have um, a parent or guardian that's over the age of 25 in the vehicle with them, and they cannot uh, drive on the freeway. So uh, the crash data shows that you know the, uh, the, the juveniles were... Uh, more likely to be involved in crashes on the freeway, so they restricted that also. And then uh, once, once they successfully completed uh, a year of this, this uh, basically provisional steps, they could apply for a, uh, once the year goes by and they, uh, they complied with the restrictions, they weren't issued any citations or uh, had any penalties by the Department of Motor Vehicle, they were given a basic Class C license, which allows you to drive an automobile. Or uh, it comes into effect when they turn 18 years old. So the, the requirements were, were pretty simple. And uh, you know, at, at first, 
the teams thought they were being unfairly targeted. Uh, they were being discriminated by by the Department of Motor Vehicles. But uh, so they, you know, the DMV released all their statistics. Uh, we've we've been pretty successful in the city of Irvine uh, dealing with teens, and we we found that uh, most uh, are complying with the requirements of the graduated driver's license. In fact, this this year we started last year, but in this year, upcoming year, uh, in every one of our high schools, we we are doing a Start Smart program where in order to get a parking permit on campus, you have to uh, attend one of the Start Smart classes where they, uh, we have uh, the school resource officers in the schools actually talking about the GDL requirements, uh, how we are enforcing them, and if they get a uh, ticket for uh, a violation of any of that, it, it'll extend the length of their uh, you know, graduated driver's license until they turn 18 years old, and plus it'll go on their record. So we, we've had great success in compliance by at least the kids driving around in Irvine. Um, and even with the other distractions, uh, for example, the cell phones, it, this, this last April we had uh, our big distracted driving month. It was a statewide initiative uh, where we enforced all the distracted driving laws regarding the use of cell phones or other distractions in the vehicle. And uh, that month alone, we issued over 2,500 citations to drivers utilizing either their cell phone or doing text messaging. And uh, of, of those 2,500 citations, only uh, four were issued to uh, kids that were between the ages of uh, 16 and 18 years old. So. We, we even have great compliance with the other distracted driving laws. So, uh, and I, I would credit that at least a little bit to our school resource officers talking to our kids in, in the schools. So, uh, unless there's any uh, questions at the end, uh, I think I am done with my portion. Thank you, Lieutenant Hallinan. Our third presenter is Dr. Joseph O'Neill. Dr. O'Neill is an Associate Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis. He has worked at the local, state, and national level to prevent childhood injury. He is the Chair of the Injury Prevention Committee for the Indiana Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and Associate Medical Director of the Automotive Safety Program at Riley Hospital for Children. Dr. O'Neill has served on the Governor's Commission on Childhood Poverty and the Governor's School Bus Committee. He has worked with state legislators to enhance child, Indiana's child passenger safety laws and graduated driver license laws. Nationally, he is an executive member on the National Council for Injury Violence and Poison Prevention for the AAP. Dr. O'Neill received his bachelor's and master's of science in civil engineering, specializing in structural mechanics from the University of Notre Dame. He worked as a professional engineer for five years before attending Indiana University School of Medicine. Afterwards, he completed his pediatric residency at Riley Hospital for Children. Dr. O'Neill was on staff at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago and Evanston Hospital in Evanston, Illinois, before returning to Indiana, where he is on the clinical faculty in the section of developmental pediatrics at Riley Hospital for Children. Dr. O'Neill's current projects include evaluating methods to increase child safety seat and seat belt use, as well as methods to increase parental involvement in the adolescent driver training process. Most recently, he helped to develop Indiana's student athletes concussion legislation and promoting best practice for concussion management statewide. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Can you hear me all right? Um, I also want to thank uh, Phyllis and Lieutenant Helen for all the great work that they're doing. Um, I, I'm pleased to be with you today. I find this uh, in a very important topic. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad to be able to be here with you this afternoon. Um, like Phyllis, I have no uh, disclosures, no financial relationships, and I'm not going to talk about any uh, unapproved or experimental um, devices or present in my presentation. Uh, Jamie, I'm having a hard time 
advancing my slides here. Okay. Um, Excuse the interruption. <laughs> I see. Um, we can see your your first slide, but what I can do is we can advance them on my side. Okay, sure. Give me one second. Okay. You know, I'll go on and talk about um, one of the things. While I have no financial interest, I certainly have a, a personal interest. You know, I have a 14-year-old son who is already starting to talk about driving. And as I was thinking back on this, you know, I, as a pediatrician father, you know, I, I kept my hand on him while he was on the changing table. I held his hand while he was going up and down stairs. I, I kept my hand within arm's reach when he was in the pool learning how to swim. And I would high five him as he came off the diamond. And now he's 14, soon to turn 15, and he's going to start driving. And I'm going to be letting go of that hand and expecting him to complete a developmental milestone that all parents expect their children to eventually accomplish that actually will be one that is potentially fatal. And I take that with great seriousness. And uh, so and I'm, I'm pleased that all of you who are with us today are here because I, I want to share with you what I really think is very important uh, for the leading cause of death for our, for our teams. And so uh, I thank you for that opportunity. So what we're going to talk about today is anticipatory guidance for our parents and teams. So I'm going to I'm going to give you some, some facts to put in your formulary of facts about teen driving. We're going to talk about anticipatory guidance and then what the key messages should be. And how are we going to present those in the office setting that, that will get the attention of the parent. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about resources that are available, that are online and in the community, and recommendations for our pediatrician. Okay, Jamie. So, you know, I've been get, doing anticipatory guidance in, in primary care and in subspecialty care for the past uh, over 20 years. And I do it, you know, I've, I've done it so much I never really thought about what anticipatory guidance was. So in preparing for this uh, presentation, I, I, I went back to uh, Bright Futures and the, some of the academy resources. And we know that anticipatory guidance is, is information. It's information that we're giving to our families to help them prepare for ex, you know, the expected physical and behavioral changes that our children and our adolescents are going to experience between the time we see them today and the time we see them at the next visit. We want our anticipatory guidance to be evidence-based, efficient, and effective. It needs to be targeted, and it's always going to be relationship-based. Anticipatory guidance we know works, especially in the area of injury prevention. Think about the, the success we've had with car seats, safe sleep, the back to sleep program, infant walkers. You know, the problem is, is that there's so much to cover and so little time to do it in. Thanks, Jamie. So there are some strategies that we can employ for anticipatory guidance, and there's a lot of different ways of going about this. There's the checklist, which is great for us. It's thorough, but it's, it's really fairly boring during a, uh, a health maintenance visit. Questionnaires are efficient, and they are more parenting focused. We can address a little bit more of their areas of interest. Uh, but it can be inefficient. There's personal digital assistance. We can use computer terminals, kiosks in our office. Um, it can be somewhat parenting focused because they're looking for that information. But, you know, they have to query. It's harder to teach. It's information that's uh, it's, it's all unidirectional. There can be literacy and privacy problems. Now, for teen driving, the one that I like the best are open-ended questions. Now, I will admit that it may not be the quickest way of doing things, but with practice, we can get this down to a fairly efficient uh, and and not long, it doesn't take long to hit the main points. It, it builds upon the relationship that we have with our parents and our teens, and it, it leads to discussion. Okay, Jamie. 
So what I want to talk about now is something that we can place in our formulary of facts that while we're having this discussion with our parents, we can, if they want, we can go into these areas and talk about these particular risk factors. These risk factors are real important because they have formed the basis of our GDL laws and it has also helped us to, to direct our parent-teen driver agreements and negotiate limits on teen driving that we know that will work. Now we're talking about experience. We're talking about our teens with risk taking. That would include speeding. Uh, number of teen passengers. We find that to be a very large risk factor. Alcohol and substance abuse. Nighttime driving and hazardous conditions. Um, I know California has perfect weather, but here in Indianapolis, we don't always have great weather. And it's not unreasonable to take driver's ed during the summer when it's wonderful out, and then you don't start driving until winter where there's ice and snow and rain and sure does change driving conditions. We're going to talk about high-speed roads, uh, the importance of safety belts, one of the leading causes of crashes, which is distracted driving, and that's not just for teens, that's for all of us. Fatigue, which I haven't met a teen yet who hasn't said there's, they could use some more sleep, and hazard perception. Hey, Jamie. So let's start with inexperience. We know that novice drivers are less proficient at detecting and responding to hazards. They're less proficient at controlling the vehicle. They haven't had the hours behind the wheel. They don't really know how to handle the distractions, and they really are just learning about the dangers. So we know that while the number of crashes per million miles of age is uh, miles driven by the age of the driver, it's really almost four times a 60, that of a 16-year-old compared to, you know, the older drivers in the 20 to 24-year age group. Now we know that supervised practice driving helps to reduce the risk of crashes. You know, kids, when dad and mom are sitting next to them, aren't doing the same things that they're doing when they're driving alone. And we know that the greatest risk for crashes occurs during that early, those early months of solo driving. Especially the highest risk for 16-year-olds are during that first three to 5,000 miles of independent driving. Go ahead. So, you know, the inexperience is one of the single most important risk factors for teenage, uh, teen driver crashes. We know that teens will show the greatest improvement in, in their driving safety in those first, within that first year and the first several thousand miles of independent driving. And it keeps on improving throughout a driver's uh, lifetime. So we recommend that the teens limit their driving under the high risk conditions. Until that teen has developed, uh, hasn't had a, a, a good experience under less risky conditions. So we know that teen, when we talk about teen risky behavior, you know, all of us have lived through this and we've all lived through things that we think back on and just shake our heads. We know that teens engage in more risky driving behavior than any other age group. You know, one time parents and teens were both asked what they did behind the wheel. Parents were completely clueless to the behaviors and underestimated the risky behaviors that kids took while driving. So we recommend that we, we frequently ex emphasize with our, with our teens that they follow all safe driving laws and set limits on high-risk driving behaviors. Go ahead. Um, one of the uh, large risk factors is the number of, number of passengers, especially teenage passengers in, in the vehicle. When we look at 16 and 17 year old drivers and compare it to the rest of us, now when you think about it, when we drive with passengers in the car, we're actually a little bit safer driver because we're, we're more concerned about the, about the passengers we're, tra we're transporting. Young drivers, those especially 16 and 17, their, their rate of crashes per 10,000 trips is almost seven to eight times that of us when we drive. So especially when you have a, a young male driver with a bunch of buddies in the car, that could be a real recipe for disaster. Thanks, Jamie. Well, when we talk at high speeds, you know, our, our, we, with practice, 
we develop those those neural connections that allow us to react to our the driving conditions in an efficient manner. And so the faster you go, the less reaction time you have. The more mass that you're moving and the more energy that you're handling. And we know that fatal crashes as as the rate of speed goes up, so do the percent of fatal crashes. So as so we recommend that a teen limits their unsupervised driving to familiar lower speed rows for the initial months of licensure. And then we want them to gradually uh, increase their unsupervised driving on higher speed roads as they gain more experience. When we talk about nighttime driving, we know that the most severe teen crashes occur at night. Night driving is more dangerous. You know, things look different out on the road daytime compared to nighttime. There's limited visibility. We may be more tired after you know, a hard day of high school or a hard day of work. We're not as, as sharp as we need to be. And there's also the opportunity to have uh, alcohol consumption with driving. With a level two license, teens cannot drive from midnight to 5 a.m. However, many serious teen crashes occur between 9 p.m. and midnight. So we re the recommendation that we would have for teens while they are going through this early driver training period is that they, they that the parents set an early evening restriction for the teens on supervised driving. Probably about sundown for during the first several months of licensure and then gradually relaxing that, that uh, restriction as the teen gains more driving experience. You know, nighttime motor vehicle crashes, next slide, Jamie, thanks. Uh, for, for 100 million miles traveled is six times higher for male drivers 6 to 19 years of age than for the rest of us. Uh, and we know that 42% of teenage motor vehicle crashes occur between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m., with the greatest between 9 p.m. and midnight. One of the things I always think about is that my mom always said nothing good happens after 11 o'clock at night. That's wisdom I, I need, to, need to live by. Okay, Jamie. When we're talking about, about bad weather, we know that bad weather makes driving more dangerous for all of us. But you know, teen drivers don't have enough experience in bad weather conditions to know how to react safely. So what we recommend is that parents need to limit the teens driving in bad weather. Allow unsupervised driving only in good weather for during that first few months. And, and then gradually allow unsupervised driving in more severe weather as they gain more experience. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, alcohol and drugs. Uh, we shouldn't, this should not need to be said, but it does. Any amount of alcohol drugs or drugs produces impairment in all of us, but we know that teens metabolize alcohol and drugs differently than adults. That doesn't make it any better for the rest of us. However, this combination can be deadly. There needs to be zero tolerance for driving using alcohol or other substances. And the same goes for passengers, that anyone riding with someone who has had alcohol or other substance abuse, it's just not acceptable. Okay, Jamie. We know that seatbelts save lives. We've known that for years. Seatbelt reduced the, the risk of serious injury in a crash by 45%. Wearing seatbelts is required in all states, whether the state has a primary seatbelt law or a secondary. And it's required that all teens wear their seatbelts while they're, while they're driving. Unfortunately, we know that teens are a group of, of drivers who tend not to wear their, their seatbelts. So the recommendation in terms of anticipatory guidance for teens is that they should wear their seatbelts and everyone in the car should wear the seatbelts on every trip. Okay, Jamie. Um, you know, I was remembering back when I when I got my first car, and uh, Phyllis mentioned that. I remember it was a it was an old Rambler who was a it was sort of rectangle, and by the time I got done with it, it was oval. And the reason I got that car was because it was the one that we had in the family, and that uh, it was the one that I think they didn't care if it got messed up. But you know, teens have the greatest risk of crashes than anyone else in the family. So we, we, 
I, I know as I'm thinking about this for my own son, I want to make sure he has the safest vehicle available. And so I would recommend that the team drive a mid-size, a full-size vehicle, small engine, and has all the current latest safety equipment, especially airbags. And I and I and I think about it. I, you know, I, and I also counsel parents that they shouldn't let their teens get their own vehicles until they gain a lot more experience driving unsupervised. Distracted driving is probably the the leading cause of crashes for all ages. You know, it takes our our mind off our driving. Yeah. Driving can be somewhat mundane. We take the same route to work or school every day, and we sort of get used to it. Our mind wanders, or we start doing other things that we shouldn't. But all distractions at any time while we're driving endangers the driver, the passengers, and everyone around us. And this includes texting, using a cell phone or smartphone, my iPhone, eating or drinking, talking to passengers, grooming, Reading, including maps, using a navigation system, watching a video, or adjusting my, my radio, my CD player, or my M3 plea player, if I had one. Um, you know, the other day I was driving into work and I passed a, a not a teenage driver, but it was a driver who was uh, drinking a cup of coffee, talking on the cell phone, and had a newspaper balanced up against the steering wheel. I slowed down a lot and let that person get away from me. I was really worried about their safety and mine. So what are the keys to anticipatory guidance and teen driving safety? Remember to remind our parents that motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death for adolescents. And some of the biggest risk factors are distracted driving, driving at night, high-speed roads, and with a lot of teen passengers. The important thing is that parents can set limits on a teen's early driving activities so that they can gain experience safely. You know, licensing requirements and the GDL laws that Lieutenant Hallinan talked about are so important. And they're, they are, while they are helpful, it's just a minimum. Well, the way I like to think about it, it forms a foundation for the rest of the, the restrictions that parents can place on their young driver's early driving behavior so that they increase their safety. The important thing about parents, parents are the key. Uh, that's a program that was started by the CDC, and I, I love that name because parents truly are the key. Um, next slide, thanks, Jamie. You know, parents are the gatekeepers of the car. Most of us uh, have the uh, advantage of knowing that our children can get someplace and we don't have to drive them, but that added freedom comes at, the, at a worry of whether or not they'll get there safely. You know, parents can control the keys, and they, in some states, the, the parent is given the license to give to the child or to the team. The parents allow access to the vehicle. They, they uh, oftentimes will pay for the gas and insurance, but they also have the right to do uh, limit setting as well. As I mentioned, parents often underestimate the risks that teens take behind the wheel. And they oftentimes can get out-negotiated by their teens as they tend to set limits on the driving. And the other thing that is very important to work with with parents is that they need to serve as good role models. The important thing to remember about anticipatory guidance is that it does work. Parents often need guidance when supervising a new teen driver. And we have been resources for those parents from the moment they, they came, the first time they came into our office for infant visits all the way up now through adolescence. And one of the things that we can offer to them are parenting driver agreements to help them negotiate limits on risky driving behavior. And the important thing to remember that there are quick and effective interventions that are possible. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. And if we can go to the next slide, Jamie, thanks. Some of the resources for our parents and teens, uh, there are parenting driver agreements, which I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, this afternoon, videos and interactive computer programs, driver simulators, written materials, enhanced driver education programs, electronic data recorders, and onboard cameras. And many of these have been shown to help 
supervise driving behavior, not just in teams, but in other industries as well. The important thing about these, these tools that we can use is that it's only going to be as good as what the parent uses. So if you think about electronic data recorders and onboard cameras, oftentimes they'll send a report to the parent that will tell them what their teen's doing behind the wheel. If the parent doesn't do anything with that information, it really isn't going to cause a change in behavior that they're intended to do. So it's important if the parent's going to use that to take advantage of that information and make changes. It's sort of like a quality assurance program that parents can do as being an authoritative type of parent where you set the limits but you are actively involved in supervising. So next slide. So let's take some time and talk about the parenting driver agreements or contracts. You know, it's based on us as parents setting limits on a teen driver's behavior. We list the rules and expectations. We list the consequences for breaking the rules. Because without consequences, this agreement lacks um, teeth. And parents and teens sign the agreement. I plan to put mine on the refrigerator so we can all see it. And then as Joseph starts driving and starts gaining experience and successfully negotiates different steps along the, the agreement, I will gradually relax the limits and let him do more and more activities behind the wheel. The important thing is that it does not replace graduated driver's licensing, but it helps to assist the parents in supervising this early driving behavior. Thanks, Jamie. So what, do these work? So if we're going to use it, does this, have, does this work for us? So there was some great work done by Simons Morton from the National Institute of Health back several years ago. And when they compared, uh, they took a state and they through a driver's ed, uh, through a, uh, a Bureau of Motor Vehicles program, when they compared parenting dyads who did not use a contract to those who did, those who did have more driving restrictions 12 months out. And it's been shown that the more restrictions that a parent places on a teen's driving behavior, the safer that young driver will be. Now these contracts have shown, uh, these agreements have shown that uh, they, have, they do affect uh, motor vehicle crashes and have decreased violations. Go ahead. Now there's a lot of them out there in the, um, uh, on the market. There's a checkpoints program. Uh, the Young Driver Parenting uh, is a program which I'm involved with currently, the I Promise. Uh, the CDC has one, uh, the, uh, you, the Parents Hold the Key. Um, there's the American Academy of Pediatrics one, and then the Chrysler Road Ready Teen Program. Thank you. So what should we do as pediatricians? We recommend, and this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics Teen Driver Statement, we need to know the laws concerning medical conditions and driving. For example, uh, what is the California requirements for driving if a young person has seizures? Or what about attention deficit disorder? We know that teens with attention deficit disorder, with or without hyperactivity, have an increased risk of crashes, and that if we treat these young people, they will do much better driving. We recommend that we know the local GDL laws, and it's important upon the state chapters to help their pediatricians and, and all providers know what the local laws are. During our anticipatory guidance, to alert parents and teens to high-risk situations, discourage distracted driving, and encourage seatbelt use counsel teens about impaired driving, and certainly encourage our parents to be good role models. I, I do encourage the use of parent-teen driver agreements, and we need to know the resources, as I've talked about, that are available for both the parents and teens. Next. Now, that's great within the parent-teen and physician relationship, but we need to step outside the office. What we need to do is support community efforts that encourage safe teen driving. Work with our schools and communities to encourage seatbelt use and discourage alcohol use. 
was very interesting when we were looking at the data for crashes uh, by hours of the day, we noticed that there was a blip between 12 and 3. When we went back and looked at that, we noted that this is oftentimes when upperclassmen are allowed to go off campus to get lunch. And really no child, no teen during the school day wants to get out and get into a wreck. But one of the things that we do know happen is that these do, uh, these crashes do occur. So one of the things that we could do is discourage school policies that allow students to drive off campus for lunch. We need to support strong GDL laws in states and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the Institute for uh, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, all have recommendations for ideal graduated driver's licensing laws. We, we need to encourage our, our colleagues in law enforcement to support and enforce GDL and seatbelt laws. And we need to support primary seatbelt laws for all occupants in all vehicles in every state. Jamie. Uh, and with that, I, I will be happy to stop here and take some questions. Thank you very much. Um, let me get back to, um, we will be taking questions momentarily. Um, at this time, I want to invite um, Dr. Phyllis Agrim back on to describe our Moving Teens Safely resource flash drive um, that we will have available to you um, in the next few weeks. Dr. Agrim, are you there? Thank you. Um, what you'll get on a flash drive, all of you who have participated, um, are the following. One, um, you'll get information on the graduated driver license schedule. Two, a sample of a parenting driving agreement. A parent's pledge that you'll be a role model for responsible driving and, and uh, not engage in behaviors you wouldn't want your kid to engage in when you're driving. Um, We've created a supervised driving log that you can customize um, to track the behind wheel driving hours of your teen. Um, parents get the facts, a teen driving fact sheet, a fact sheet on dangers, uh, driving schools located throughout Orange County, um, a list, a partial list of available apps and devices to curb cell phone use and texting while behind the wheel. And of course, we suggest they put the cell phone in the trunk or the glove compartment and not even be tempted to have access. Um, a little video on graduated driver licensing law and additional resources. So we're encouraging you to use the flash drive. You can um, download any of the products here. You can print them off for your patients. You could even put all of these on a flash drive and give them to your patients. So I think this will be a valuable resource. We thank you very much for listening, um, and we hope that you'll include um, safe teen driving in your anticipatory guidance um, for your teens, actually beginning before they apply for their uh, driver licensing law, uh, driver license. Thank you. Thanks. At this time, um, I'm, we have um, a couple of questions for, for the presenters. Um, this is a question for Dr. Hallen, or, I'm sorry, for Lieutenant Hallinan. Um, when does a new driver need to be covered by insurance? Uh, can uh, you hear me now? Yes. OK. So uh, I, I, a driver, I'm not exactly sure how the insurance companies work, but uh, I believe they're covered if their parents have the car insured. Uh, but once they obtain their driver's license, for, for the matter of the, uh, the permit driving, uh, but once the, I think they have to be added on uh, their parents' insurance once they get their regular driver's license uh, at age 16, even, even if it is a a graduated driver's license. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is for Dr. O'Neill. 
um, once the driver is 18, the rules change. How do you, or, um, how do you recommend a parent deal with the challenge of a new driver and fewer limits? Wow, that's a great question. Um, in fact, there's been, as we've looked at the effect of graduated driver's licensing laws, we have seen an uptick in the 18-year-olds who are experiencing more crashes. And some of us tend to think that this is because they are tending to wait until they turn 18 when the graduated driver's licensing law does not apply to them. And so that is a, that is a real dilemma for a parent because to a certain extent, they're certainly considered an adult. And what I would recommend is that they appeal to them from a, and from a reason standpoint that you know this is a very dangerous time and that you need to be very careful and especially when you have uh, friends in the car or to try to limit distractions and make sure they're always wearing the seatbelt. The things that we talk about don't change, but the parent's ability to enforce those may become a lot less as the, as the adolescent gets older. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Agrin, one question for you. Um, when would you suggest um, practice on freeway driving, introducing freeway driving? Uh, that's a difficult question, and I might refer to uh, Mike Hallinan. I think uh, first they need to be comfortable on simple roads, and, and just as you advance to more difficult traffic conditions, I would then advance to the freeway. But I have to tell you a couple things. When my kid was 16, and he's now well into his 40s, I found a piece of paper where I had him sign a little contract between me and him <laughs> that it was my car, I had the authority to decide when and if he would drive, and I had the keys. And there were a couple other items as well. But I remember um, I was a little leery about taking him on the freeways, and I think I deferred that to uh, his father. <laughs> but uh, Mike, maybe you could better address that. No, that's, that's great advice, Dr. Agron. Uh, the contracts are great because kids know that if there's a contract in place, as long as you hold up your end to the contract. So uh, the accountability component is huge. If the kids know there is uh, consequences to actions, so if they do something in violation of that contract, they know immediately they're going to lose the, the privileges uh, because driving is a privilege. And when I was a young driver, when I turned 16 years old, my parents had a contract with me. And if I, I knew without question that if I violated any of the contract rules, the keys were gone. And they were gone for a long time. So uh, I didn't want to lose my right to drive, so I never violated that contract. But as far as driving on the freeway, uh, again, I, I would go uh, really on the discretion. Kid, kids learn how to drive at different rates, and it's being comfortable on the streets. Uh, the freeway is is almost a raceway nowadays, and it, there's so many cars, and it is difficult to navigate for a young, inexperienced driver. So uh, I, I would just say you have to ensure that your child is comfortable driving the regular streets and go with them. Make sure that you supervise them uh, at least the first few times when they're navigating the freeway also because there are different rules in place and it's different techniques of driving on the freeway. Thank you so much. Um, this, uh, we're unfortunately out of time and but I want to thank um, our presenters and thank all of you who attended today. Um, just a reminder that we will be sending an electronic evaluation, and to please complete that, that helps us. For those of you who are receiving CME, um, it's required, so please get that to us as soon as possible so we can get your CME certificate out to you. Thank you again for attending, um, and check back with us at um, our website, www.aapca4.org, for more um, more educational opportunities. Thanks.